be recorded. Okay. So uh, thanks everyone for being here today. And I want to say a big thank you to our presenter uh, for agreeing to give a talk uh, today too. Uh, so our speaker today is uh, Dr. Freinstein Sigmundsen, and uh, he's from the Nordic Volcanic Center in Iceland. And he'll be uh, talking about the ongoing period of high volcanic activity in Iceland and the November, November 2023 uh, Grand Diet injection and its implication to continental rifting. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, uh, what will I do in this talk? Uh, I, I will give you a little bit of introduction to Iceland uh, and the techniques I've been using mostly together with a, a, a last group of collaborators uh, here in Iceland. On, on using um, geodetic techniques or how we can measure the crustal movements. Uh, we, we have some uh, in the audience that are specialists on Iceland. So if I'm missing something, please add in at the end, uh, those who know the areas uh, well, and some who are, are new to Iceland maybe, but we are on a, on a divergent plate boundary here in Iceland, uh, and the 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 map in the inset on, uh, on the on the lower edge of the shows uh, Iceland next to Greenland, and we have the Mid Atlantic Ridge that crosses Iceland, and the typical eruptions we have here in Iceland are like the one on the on the figure fissure eruptions. This is the beginning of a new fissure eruption, uh, and uh, we have. Uh, beginning in 2021, we have had a, a period of high vulcan volcanic activity. And I want to uh, give you a little information on that. In particular, this one uh, very important event in, in uh, November. And Grindavík uh, is a name of a town that was affected uh, by a dike injection. Uh, so, uh, Iceland plate boundary, we have the divergent plates, they are separating apart, and we have the mid-Atlantic ridge uh, that uh, crosses Iceland, and the reason for Iceland being about sea level uh, is it is interacting uh, with uh, excessive mantle upwelling. Uh, so the situation is somewhat comparable to the AFAR region in Africa, where we have uh, an on-land part uh, uh, of the drift system that uh, links the, the Red Sea and Gulf of uh, uh, Aden, uh, and uh, we have a mantle plume uh, under. And in Iceland, the seismicity, so these are the, the earthquakes larger than magnitude 4, and in Iceland, we have, we have seismicity typically distributed like this, uh, in the very southwest part of Iceland, we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, coming on, on land, and there's a, a line of seismicity. And, and then we then we have, in, in the southern half of Iceland, we have the eastern and western uh, branches of the rift in Iceland, uh, uh, similar as in many continental rifting setting that we have uh, uh, that the plate boundary is divided. And in North Iceland, uh, it is a little more simple. Uh, there is one plate boundary and then offshore North Iceland, uh, seismicity shifts again uh, uh, towards the, the west. And and uh, so there is a lot of seismicity, but then occasionally we have uh, some uh, episodes of activity. Uh, and uh, Geology of Iceland is something like this. Uh, in, in blue in this geological map are, are rocks that are older than about 3.3 million years. And we say they, they are to the sort of far east and to the far west uh, uh, in Iceland. And what is in red are post-glacial lava. So a very important marker uh, for the geology of Iceland is uh, uh, relating to the glaciations. So Iceland uh, was fully glaciated uh, during the Ice Ages, uh, and what is white in this figure are present-day ice caps. They cover about 10% of Iceland, 
and then red are the, the post-glacial lava fields. And the spreading uh, is the cause, uh, the spreading plus the, the um, sort of mantle of dwelling is the cause for the uh, volcanic activity in Iceland. Uh, in the very southwest, uh, we have uh, an arrow, black arrow pointing to this Grindavik dike in 2023. And prior to that, we had uh, activity at a very nearby area called Pagradalsfjall. Uh, and that was the, uh, that the, the photo on my initial slide was uh, from there. Uh, and we had three eruptions there uh, in 2021, 22, and 23, <clears throat> major diking events. <clears throat> and then we had the activity shifting a little bit to the west, to the Grindavik area. Uh, and since the since 10th of November, we have actually had five eruptions in the in the Grindavik area. Uh, activity is very episodic in Iceland. Uh, the plates are moving. You can see arrows on the uh, figure. Uh, Nine point seven millimeters per year in each direction. That's about the same speed as your fingernails are growing, uh, <clears throat> and this leads to to uh, extensional. Uh, forces at the plate boundary then that are then released in in these what we would call lifting episode uh, the the volcanoes are a little special in iceland they have very sort of long what we call fissure swarms and if you look for example in the north uh, of iceland at this volcano marked kr or krabla k r a f l a we see uh, a red line that corresponds to something called a central volcano. Then there's a caldera uh, in part of it. And then there's a fissure swarm that uh, uh, extends uh, very far north and to the south. And this is because of the plate spreading. When we have magmatic activity, uh, there is a need uh, to release the extensional stresses. And what we have been learning uh, now in these events since 2021 is how it sort of we are trying to get a better understanding of the coupling, we can say, between tectonics uh, and volcanic activity. And then on the, on the techniques, so my background uh, sort of main technique has been uh, to, to use in my career uh, ground deformation has always been important. Uh, uh, so, and combining ground deformation and seismicity. Uh, and this figure is, for example, uh, uh, shows data uh, from the Eya Fjalla Jökull eruption, explosive eruption in 2010, that, that closed Europe's airspace. Uh, and for geodesy, we can we can have stations we measure sort of episodically or maybe come once a year, set up an antenna, or we can have it more uh, 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 longer term uh, uh, as the the uh, the antenna with the with the dome. Uh, these systems are using the global navigation and satellite system geodesy geodetic measurements. Uh, in the past, it was the, the GPS, the Global Positioning System, but there are, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are more systems available now. And with these uh, measurements, we can, we can track uh, ground deformation. We can see uh, how many millimeters stations are moving. Like uh, in the main panel there, there is uh, data from three stations. And we can see, uh, if you look at the timeline, that the green station starts to, to move uh, around the beginning of 2010. It's just deviation from a straight line. And it is actually, this is the station south of the Eyjafjallajökull volcano. Uh, the location of the three stations are, are marked on, on the small panel. Uh, and the station to the south uh, starts to move actually southwards horizontally because new magma is coming into the the volcano uh, and the seismicity uh, the number of earthquakes 
uh, the gray shading is a count of the number of earthquakes in this panel, and we see they start to increase. So typically in Iceland, we are trying to understand ground deformation and seismicity, and we use uh, a lot GNSS, and we use uh, uh, a, 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 a lot also uh, INSAR, or interferometric analysis of synthetic aperture radar images. Uh, these data are uh, uh, fully from satellites, satellite images uh, acquired by synthetic aperture radar satellites or that satellites that have this kind of instruments. And the first uh, thing that comes out of these uh, data is a comparison of two radar images uh, showing interferograms like the, the one in the middle upper panel uh, where we have some fringes or, or colors, uh, where each uh, cycle of color typically has a, a specific meaning that relates to the wavelength of the satellite. Uh, and this is, we call it line of sight displacement. Uh, we can take this data and we can transform it into, or, or basically we call it unwrapping. And then we have the numbers in millimeters or centimeters. But basically it, it is not, only vertical displacement, it's actually called line of sight displacement from satellite. And, and from data like this, we are trying to piece together histories of what happens inside volcanoes, because when we combine the GNSS and INSAR, uh, combine the INSAR and compare, for example, to, to model prediction, we can come up with a, a, a model what's happening in the subsurface. So. This is a, a, a little bit background, and then we are trying to use this to, to study the volcanic plumbing systems. We can say, uh, here two views of this, uh, widely used models from Kasman uh, and others uh, in 2017, uh, question where we have magma lenses or liquid layers of magma inside volcanoes. Uh, in some volcanoes, we may have a very extensive uh, magma uh, mass uh, uh, as shown uh, in the in the figure from Kathy Kasman. But in other models, uh, schematic models for Iceland, there is a suggestion that there is much less uh, uh, of this mushy material, but maybe more uh, proportionally more liquid magma. Uh, <clears throat> we are trying uh, here in Iceland to, to understand when we have the eruptions occurring. And we have realized uh, it, it's, a, it's an interplay uh, that is both pressure to, uh, to magma inflow or outflow into crystal uh, volumes in the subsurface. There is also something we call buoyancy pressure because the magma is, is less dense than the surrounding uh, for, for most of its travel through the mantle and crust. And uh, there is a failure limit that we don't know very well. Uh, and there can be external effects, deviatoric stresses, uh, that can sort of influence when an eruption occurs. Uh, and uh, in Iceland, the tectonics, the uh, extension of tectonics, actually make it easier for magma to come to the surface. And this brings us to uh, the what was special uh, about uh, 10th of November last year. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the figure on the cover of science you see here is, is from a lava flow uh, that is destroying property covering road. Uh, this is from one of the later eruptions, but in the in the paper we we discuss this initial event near the town of Grindavík. And basically we found that the magma flow in the subsurface was exceptionally rapid. And we are trying to explain that, how uh, when we see something happening uh, very quickly in, in terms of magma transfer in the subsurface, uh, what is needed to, to explain that. Uh, this is a very, important uh, area in Iceland because the eruptions uh, are now occurring very close to the town of Grindavík. As you see here, 
uh, in this figure uh, from 14th of January this year, uh, that is the, the first time a, a, an eruption was very close to the town. Actually, some lava has flowed into the town. Uh, Svart Sengi, what is uh, identified there uh, as a name, there's a power plant there. Uh, and um, also it is a source of hot water and cold water for the nearby villages. So <clears throat> we are in a, a, a very critical situation uh, in, in Iceland with activity in this area because it is <clears throat> having a major influence on, on infrastructure. And then the lights in the far background, this is our capital, Reykjavik, where, where I am now. Uh, small inset figure, 10th of November. <clears throat> there was a lot of fracturing on the surface, uh, and this is one example of fracture. Uh, the town has actually been evacuated, uh, more or less. There is, most people uh, have moved uh, away from the town of Grindavík, uh, hidden fractures, for example, this, uh, here are workers uh, uh, unrevealing a fracture that was in the sports hall of, of Grindavík, uh, under uh, this green uh, carpet uh, in the sports hall, there was a, a, a fracture, hidden fracture, so that has been the, the big issue, hidden fractures, because uh, uh, these are very dangerous uh, and difficult to see some of them. Uh, uh, aerial view, uh, town of Grindavík, and then we have the approximate surface protection of a dike that formed in, in November. It's about 15 kilometers long, and it crosses sort of the, the outskirts of, of Grindavík. Uh, uh, we have the Svartsenki and Blue Lagoon, for those who have visited, that is our most uh, famous tourist attraction, uh, uh, basically a geothermal spa. Uh, we know that next to this uh, dike, there has been an area of inflation and deflation episodes. And uh, we have been trying to understand how, how this all links together. And then uh, to the right of the 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 um, uh, surface projection of the dike is uh, the Fagradals Fjall area, where we had activity uh, in the previous three years. Whereas now activity is all basically on this red line that is the approximate surface projection of dike in November 2023, with five eruptions having occurred uh, close to the town of Grindavík now. Uh, to, to summarize, what did we, what did we uh, find out? So the, this is a, a sort of a cross-section of what we think is in the, in the subsurface. So uh, initially, there is a, a magma accumulation area that we have identified. Uh, we call it in, in this study a, a magma domain. Uh, you can call it a magma reservoir or a magma chamber, but <clears throat> it is uh, it may have individual lenses of magma uh, that have intruded uh, in recent years. And it's a, it's a mixture of liquid magma, partial melt, magma moss, and, and hot solid rock. But it is sort of a, a preferred uh, accumulation area of magma and it, it resides very close to the to the brittle ductile boundary uh, in Iceland uh, in this area at about five kilometer um, depth. Uh, what happened on 10th of November was that pressure had built up in this magma domain. Uh, we are trying to understand sort of uh, the pressure conditions that are, are responsible for uh, for moving magma around. So I come to that later in the talk. Uh, there is a failure. Uh, the general failure criterion was fulfilled, and magma flows out from here. Uh, it flows uh, in a in a narrow channel, but then basically spreads out in a laterally propagating dike. Uh, and what is very special about this dike is that 
everything happened extremely quickly. We had magma flow rates up to more than 7,000 cubic meters per second. And it flows both uh, to, towards the north and south along a, a tight plain. Uh, that is releasing the the forces that have built up uh, because of, of tectonics. And what I want to show you uh, in the following is how we how we came to this conclusion, what data allows us to 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 come to to this conclusion here. And the seismicity is very important and, and geology. So if we start with the main figure uh, in this slide, uh, Panel A, we have a we have a map of, of the sort of very southwesternmost part of Iceland where the Reykjanes Ridge comes on land or the divergent plate boundary. And there is a, a, a blue hut line there that is the central axis of the plate boundary, sort of most seismicity in the long term there. Uh, there are there are the fissures um, that are in 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 um, sort of yellow shading, we call them fissure swarms, central volcanic complexes. And we have basically uh, three centers, uh, Svartsengi next to Grindavík is one of them. Uh, and on the other side, we have uh, the letter F standing for Fagradalsfjall. And in Aurans, we have the lava flows from 2021 to 23. Uh, this is the situation on, on 10th of November. Uh, no eruptions yet close to Grindavík. Now we have had a lot of lava added on the surface close to the town of Grindavík. Uh, before uh, that happened, there is a, a red line marked there as the, the Sund Nukur crater. Oh, there was a crater of the, that was now activated again. So it seems that the Dikes are are coming into the, uh, into the uh, same uh, fissures of them uh, or same fissure area. If you look at at panel B, <clears throat> this is a map of seismicity uh, that was occurring uh, in a period uh, of uh, about uh, two to three weeks prior to this magma injection. And we see there's a, 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 a large crustal uh, area that is illuminated. And we think this is basically the magma is accumulating under this and the stresses are so high that it, it drives uh, uh, earthquakes. And then in panel C, uh, we have uh, 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 less than one day of seismicity. It is really the beginning. It is the... Uh, all the activity is localized in, in one area uh, where we had the failure of the magma domain, where magma could then in the end flow out. And then in, in panel D, uh, we have the seismicity until 11th of November, uh, 12 o'clock, but you see it's a very clean linear man, uh, and the dikes are fall almost on a vertical plane. It is a it's a tight formation, and if we if we see uh, the bottom panel E, uh, uh, this is the actually sorry the on the scale on on the left the scale is is latitude, uh, so there's a broad area uh, until it localizes. Uh, uh, then we have the blue dots, and but thereafter, when the dike starts to form, we see propagation of seismicity both to increasing latitude and decreasing uh, latitude. And this is the dike propagating in, in two directions. So this is what the seismicity is telling us. And, uh, and uh, how can we use the geodesy to add to this uh, story? Uh, first of all, we, we have a station. Uh, we have long uh, series of observations of ground deformation in Iceland. And this is a station that's basically on top of this magma domain. And we know uh, that if you take the, the um, last decades, there was a general subsidence of this station. This is just showing the vertical component. Uh, measured uh, once per year initially and then continuously. 
Uh, but in the in two thousand, uh, we start to have inflation episodes, and we we know uh, there were uh, a whole series of inflation episodes. The uh, in there when pressure was uh, increasing uh, in this magma domain, followed by some subsidence. Uh, there have been different interpretations of of, of of this, whether this is related to volcanic gas, uh, geothermal processes, or magma inflow. But in any case, the pressure is building up. Uh, and then on 10th of November, we had a very large volume of magma coming out from, from this area. Uh, the the INSAR uh, works like this. We, we have uh, the main panels, we have wrapped figures and then unwrapped. So, and you see uh, the wrapped one uh, has uh, uh, the, the fringes, whereas uh, the unwrapped, then the scale is now uh, into millimeters. And we have a, a whole series of other interferograms. We have a lot of uh, satellite data uh, from these events that can be used. And this is telling us how the Earth is moving. It is line of sight, it is not vertical because it is implicit in the uh, INSAR technique that you you need to look, the satellite needs to look to the side. So this is what happened during the final inflation episode. So from 27th of October to 10th of November, the area was inflating, pressure was increasing, and on 10th of November, there was a failure and magma could flow out. Uh, we we can take this data and we can do uh, modeling of it uh, and then we um, typically work with the, the data after we have changed it into millimeters or, or meters that is unwrapped like in, in shown in panel B and we can combine it with observations from, from GNSS uh, horizontal displacements like the arrows that you uh, see in, in panel A, uh, the data are the blue arrows and the, and the when we have a geodetic model, we, we suggest uh, uh, basically a, a source and we are trying to sort of, one can say, figure out what this source is by comparing the predicted ground deformation on the surface uh, to uh, observations. Uh, and we can compare these arrows uh, as in panel A. Uh, the red and blue arrows, they, they are quite comparable. Uh, and we can also compare the INSAR, the prediction of the line of sight change, panel B and C, and they are quite similar. And therefore, we have small residuals uh, that are shown in, in panel D. That's the difference between the data and model. So this is uh, what how geodesy is being used by the Icelandic Meteor Meteorological Office that I collaborate extensively with, where there's a team trying to give uh, or responsible for warnings to uh, um, society about what is going on. Uh, and we have a very good collaboration, University of Iceland and the Icelandic Met Office. The GNSS, uh, there are not only displacement in, in certain period, but we can, if we have continuous stations, we can track how its station is, is moving with time. And, and here we, we see uh, sort of a, uh, both the, well, we in, in, in pink is the surface projection of the dike that formed. We have in black circles uh, earthquakes, but the color dots, they, uh, show the movement at each of these GNSS sites that we're continuously recording. And the time period here is from 16 o'clock on the 10th of November until, until midnight on 10th of November. Uh, and you see the scale at the bottom, where it is from blue to red arrow dot, this scale is 20 centimeters. So they are moving quite a, a, a lot, very, very fast movement. That is one of the reasons we concluded there is, uh, there is, um, um, or or sort of, 
yeah the fast movement of the GNSS sites tells us basically how this dike is forming and we we have two graphs here um of westward movement at at one of these sites uh close to the dike and we see if we look at the time scale uh that the displacement rates uh, the with the red curve they're up to 25 centimeters per hour and cumulative it's about 80 centimeters uh movement and we we also see that most of this change happens in about six hours so the bulk of this dike formed in six hours uh and we can try to estimate the volume for the dike and then we come up with with magma flow rates so the the for the diking in addition to the gnss data we have uh uh insert uh unwrap now you see the scale is is very different we have uh, in the unwrap one, we have minus 400 millimeters to, to plus 200 millimeters. And we have a whole series of, of these interferograms. Uh, and we we put it all into an inversion. Uh, the GNSS data, the NSR interferogram phase uh, change. Uh, we also have something called pixel offsets uh, uh, because there is a, a problem with the insert you see in the figure of the interferogram that the fringes they can become very closely spaced. And actually the ground deformation can be so extensive that it prevents the use of normal insert, but then we can use this pixel offsets. It is really trying to track how each figure in a, uh, in, in a satellite image is, is, is moving. And there are more techniques now uh, that can demonstrate this. Uh, we have also estimates of, of vertical displacements. Um, and we we see there is a sort of, uh, yeah, where, this, where there's a, uh, in the estimate of vertical, the, there's a large subsidence. Uh, both, it's a combination of dike and also this, Plus you drop in a, in this magma domain. So when we take all this data, we come up with with figure like this. So we we have the a dike plane. We know it's a, approximately uh, vertical, uh, and we can have different times uh, when we combine all the geodate data uh, and the time steps here, like nineteen thirty five on tenth of November. This is because we had an interferogram or constraints from, from INSAR. And then in panel B, uh, the dike has grown. Uh, and we have some volume estimate. And we come up with a volume of uh, this uh, 130 to 139 million cubic meters. And uh, this uh, quantifies the the rate basically because if we if we know how much volume of magma is moving uh, then we can um if we if we know our certain time uh, we can compare uh, uh, these numbers and get the rates and and this is what surprised us was how fast this very fast this was happening uh, we can have from gnss we can have hourly type model uh, and uh, GNSS, it, it, well, it is best to combine the GNSS and NSAR, but here we came to some intermediate way that we uh, scaled uh, the inflow rate, so it's fitted with the NSAR, and then we come up with this number over 7,000 cubic meters per second. This is an example of observations, modal residuals, and invert uh, dike opening. So the the how does this work we had the, the the we have the the magma domain where magma accumulated uh, magma is leaving that it is contracting it is under this location we call Schwarzenke. <clears throat> and basically we infer that the flow rate out from the the magma domain in this case it went all into the dike and it peaked 
uh, at this over 7,000 cubic meters per second. Uh, and most of the magma moved uh, into the dike uh, in a time span of, of uh, uh, six hours, sort of majority of it. Uh, there is a difference in, in volumes that surprises uh, many, uh, as you'll see the, uh, in, in the panel with the scaled volume change rate uh, of the dike and, and the Schwarzenegger magma domain, the, the black numbers above zero are larger than the one below. Uh, this is what we typically find. This is due to uh, compressibility of material that resides within the magma domain. Uh, then the question is, how can we basically drive this magma? Do we need something, do we need a very large uh, overpressure in the magma domain or what was driving it? Uh, and uh, we, we need to, to get this magma through a conduit that links the magma domain and the dike. We know that in general magma flow rate scales with, with pressure difference, length of path, viscosity, cross-sectional area of a dike. Uh, and then there's a geometrical factor that we have some evidence what what is, considering shape if it's more like a rectangle, it is like like given here. Uh, we from the geodetic models, we we have the magma flow rate and we wonder what these other parameters are. And uh, the the what comes out of all of this is that the the if we if we try to to summarize is that the the there are actually a number of contributions uh, when we have done our best estimates uh, we see basically uh, there are there are. Uh, something we call overpressure due to pre-inflation because when magma is accumulating, uh, it is accumulating in a closed space and it builds up pressure because of that, equal in all directions. And we are working now with pressure, so the numbers are in, in Pascal or megapascals, uh, four to five megapascals of overpressure. Uh, uh, the the buoyancy pressure or the, the magma at this depth is, is less dense than the uh, surroundings. Uh, so it wants to, to flow offwards because this less dense. And we estimate that this buoyancy pressure uh, for a certain dimension of the magma domain could be on the order of three to, to nine uh, megapascal. So there is, uh, it is not only the overpressure due to pre-inflation. Uh, when the magma flows up, it, it actually uh, gains buoyancy because the uh, magma is on its way and it is still less dense uh, than the surroundings uh, until it comes to about 2.5 kilometer steps in the crust in Iceland. Uh, this can give about 6 megapascal and then what we were emphasizing in this paper is the influence of the tectonic stress. Uh, because it, uh, as we are stretching uh, and the plates are spreading, uh, we we cause tension in the areas uh, where we will later have dikes, and this means that the magma can flow at a, a lower uh, pressure limit. And we see that the influence of tectonic stress is really important. So that was one of our conclusion in this study that if we we don't need anything special in terms of overpressure in the magma domain. It is, uh, these are the numbers we, we, we think are, are quite uh, reasonable. And we can get this uh, magma flow if we, if we have a driving pressure of, of this number, uh, 20 to 25 megapascal, uh, and we have a, a conduit uh, that is linking the magma domain and the main dike of some dimensions, uh, uh, few kilometers in length, uh, few meters in width. Uh, this can, uh, this is feasible. Uh, and I want to try to shorten here. These are implications for for uh, 
major dike swarms, uh, continental rifting, how do we form like a giant dike swarms where magma is inferred to have traveled laterally hundreds of kilometers? Um, we suggest that um, the tectonic stresses are really important contributor. Uh, in this area in Scotland, for example, uh, one can envision that widespread uplift above an arriving mantle plume head uh, created tensile stress favorable for lateral diking radiating from a focal point. This has been well understood. Our argument here has been that this influences also the speed of how, how things can move in because the dike can uh, move quickly if it has uh, more uh, driving pressure. Uh, I think I, I, I stop here. This is really my conclusion, uh, what happened on 10th of November. And we can say uh, if you have seen uh, some, some material from the recent eruptions uh, in, in Iceland, that basically this first event on 10th of November uh, still holds more Lava than has uh, erupted in in all the eruptions uh, uh, in the last three years in Iceland. So, um, uh, well, it it is uh, well. I should say, sorry, the it, it is more than that has happened near the town of of, of Grindavik. It is it is comparable to the to the biggest lava field in Fagradalsfjall that formed over a time span of six months. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Uh, now the floor is open for questions. Uh, so if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and then ask the question, or you can also write it in the chat. Okay. Okay, so there is a question. Uh, how do I see? Please go ahead. I can see who has raised in the hand. I guess, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, Ali. Yeah, Please. thank you, Daniel. It's a uh, uh, French time. Thank you very much for the wonderful lecture, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, <clears throat> you know why wonderful? Because it was uh, so simple, but the basic ideas were uh, really delivered. Uh, my uh, question related uh, to the timing. Actually, I didn't get uh, this uh, flow rate when you calculated. Is it related for a few days? Uh, for example, and as not example, it's actually the question. It would yeah. be possible to constrain these calculations based on the pre-eruption and after eruption topography measurements and calculating how much lava flow out. Yes. And this, you know, some kind of the constraint to really to show that that or maybe it's done actually, but that would be quite interesting to uh, yeah. really because because it's a you're right here, it is a weakness in the crust. What means actually weakness? Because it's a you know when when we uh, I, I, I am dealing partly with uh, modeling of uh, lava but partly with the mantle modeling as well within the mantle it's uh, okay it's you know when we rise showing the rising the uh, mantle plume and we 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 understand that the temperature mostly changing and so on some material flows but if it is a few days. I am a really a little bit surprising how such a big body <laughs> raced upward at this level. But yes. you, you definitely know the answer. Thank you. Uh, the uh, you are right. The if we have a lava eruption on the surface, it is for example, and what has been uh, during eruptions here in Iceland. Uh, mapping the lava fields, uh, seeing the volume, uh, checking how much volume has flowed out in a certain time is very uh, important. Uh, and for, for this event, I, I focused on 10th of November because it is the biggest event, or fastest. Uh, there was no magma on the surface. It is all in what is in this yellow uh, laterally propagating type. Uh, then we also 
need to consider the surface changes and we do it, we need a very precise estimate like a centimeter scale, preferably. And the, uh, so we use the NSAR and GNSS and basically, if I if I if I go uh, go back here, uh, uh, sorry to to like a model like this. Uh, this is a model. Uh, this is the the dike plane, and the amount of opening at certain time. And this is combining all the data we have, and this sort of fitting the observed ground deformation on the surface. And from models like this, we we have a volume. And we have a time span. Uh, yes, it was very surprising. Uh, so in this case, uh, the the big surprise was it most of it happened in 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 six hours. And we have some timestamps here. Uh, we know it started on tenth of November in the afternoon, and uh, at nineteen thirty five, we had about seventy to eighty cubic uh, million cubic meters, uh, and. So, so we have an we have um, various kinds of, of ways to model this, but the flow rate actually uh, then after we have these uh, individual models, we we try to do it because the GNSS is uh, recording continuously, so we could see how how when the deformation was occurring, and basically uh, the summary figure for this flow rate is. Uh, in this uh, panel A, in this figure, in black, scaled volume change, this is basically the uh, a measure of the flow rate. And it peaks only at this very last value of 7,000 cubic meters uh, for, for, for two or three hours, and then it declines very rapidly. So it is during an eruption or a diking event, it, it uh, varies by orders of magnitudes, uh, it is building up initially over a period of few hours as uh, uh, as magma is is sort of uh, expanding the the failure area or or where the where the conduit is opening, and then it starts to decline uh, because the pressure uh, driving pressure drops both because the pressure in the magma accumulation area drops. And also because the tectonic stress is released, uh, so we have we have some very good control here. But what you point out of, of mapping the sort of surface changes is really important. In general, we are kind of doing that here, but now only to figure out how the magma was moving from one place in the crust to another. And the uh, magma, magma, uh, like you mentioned, it's a magma uh, domain. Yes, the located how how uh, I mean it's deep. It is located. Uh, it there is, is no about, scale here. No, it is. Uh, it was for simplification. It is at a, a about five kilometer depth. Five kilometer. Okay. Yeah, it is at the brittle ductal transition, and uh, there is a paper that was published that has all the details. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, so the the magma domain is at about five kilometers, and this extends from five kilometers the the dike up to about a sort of an average one kilometer below the surface, and then there is some cracking, uh, faulting on the surface. Yeah, why I'm asking because it would depend also the inversion. You know, when you are doing inversion, I don't know actually technique which you use, but it's the inversion of data. Then, uh, uh might be some some issue there <laughs> that's why yeah. i ask about the depth but five kilometers is a fine yeah yeah uh, okay. there is inversion uh, applied to get figures like this mm -hmm. some very fancy inversion uh, also for the magma domain depth but it depends all like any inversion you know if we have yeah. an analog model there are it may be more of an issue all the assumptions that, that go in there's a lot of assumptions all right. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank okay, thank you for the question. There is another question in the chat. Uh, yeah. Ibrahim wants to ask at which depth did the crystal, uh, crystal, crystal mesh form? Yes. And if it's possible to deduce the rate of cooling of this mesh from the size of the crystals? 
Yeah, it, it is very interesting uh, question about the this, of course, there will be a, a lot of follow up studies on the geochemistry uh, of the adaptive proteins that came up later. So the the uh, uh, MERS uh, or this magma domain MERS plus liquid uh, lenses is at about five, six, seven kilometer depth. Now we think in this case, it, it is uh, very close to the brittle ductile transition in Iceland. So what stops magma on its way? We 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 see a lot of evidence in Iceland for magma stalling at the uh, crust uh, mantle boundary, but then also at the brittle ductile transition. So here it is a brittle ductile transition. Uh, cooling of the mass from sizes of the crystals and uh, may be difficult, but the there can be a lot learned from <clears throat> the the uh, detailed studies of crystals uh, that come out and uh, also getting a time scale uh, uh, for examples uh, of mass disintegration or basically when new magma comes in so in the nearby area, it was found to correlate very well with the seismicity. But then we start to see uh, unrest seismicity, then there is some new material coming in, and we would expect in this case, my theory would be uh, uh, that uh, the the uh, if we talk about like uh, uh, mass. Uh, sort of disintegration because there is new magma coming in that began maybe two three years prior to the eruption in this case that is when we start to see the seismicity but geochemistry will have to tell us okay thank you i hope it answered your question ibrahim uh there is another one in the chat yes. from Catherine. Yes, and, uh, she wants to ask: Do you expect future lateral dike propagation in the same area yeah. uh, with the lengthening of this uh, subsurface uh, dike? Yeah, uh, very good question. Uh, there have been there have been more dike injection following. They have been much shorter. They are on the same dike plane. Uh, we are trying to understand what limits the length of the dikes and. Uh, what is really important uh, uh, in sort of the model we have in mind is sort of uh, is, is where we are accumulating the, the tectonic stress because of the plate movements. Uh, and in this case, we have a very special situation of oblique spreading because the, the rift is not uh, perpendicular to the spreading direction, but under an angle. And it means that there is only a certain area where we are accumulating tectonic stress. Uh, maybe this dike released uh, tectonic stress of, of much of the available area uh, uh, in, in, in this place. Uh, so actually we expect the, if there are more dikes that they are shorter and there will be proportionally more and more magma erupting to the surface. So it is harder for the dike to, to propagate laterally now. And we see it in other cases in Iceland uh, and elsewhere that the, there is often something very special about the first dike. We have one uh, 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 rifting episode in North Iceland and we saw the same feature that the first dike was the longest. If we look uh, closer to uh, home for you in, in AFAR and in Ethiopia, there was this rifting episode beginning in 2006, the Tapahu uh, Mantaharo rifting episode where there were uh, a number of dikes. It was also the same pattern that the first dike was the very largest. And then the later dikes uh, covered sort of smaller areas. So. Maybe there is a pattern there that the initial event in, in where we have a, a series of, of uh, repeated dikes that it is maybe the first event that has the uh, largest possibility to propagate furthest away. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? 
I have a question for Freistein. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, as always, for these super nice presentations with a lot of insight and for bringing to the community all these wonderful data and inter data and interpretations. So my question this yeah. time is about the uh, actually is about the formation of the magma domain. Yes. Do you think you will have enough data to to figure out how it was built? Uh, it's a it's a very good question. The 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 magma domain. I didn't tell you there are constraints. Like uh uh, as you were telling me, Daniel, you're into crystal structure from seismology. I mean, uh, there are some constraints. Uh, uh, from uh, ambient seismic noise tomography, that there are, there are some low velocities there. Uh, consistent with some uh, amount of magma, but I, I think your question, Eleonora, is really the fundamental question we all like, basically, where is the magma uh, under the plate boundary, how extensive is it, uh, and um, uh, when did it come there? Uh, the suggestion we have, we have, we have suggestion from, from the, uh, sorry, I want to show you, uh, this figure here, when we look at the geology, we actually, uh, we know there's a lot of geothermal activity here in Iceland. And the, what we suggest as this magma domain, uh, maybe the heat source for the uh, uh, geothermal area above. And, and situations here at this oblique plate spreading boundary is, are a little special. So we think, first of all, of course, it's a little special to have the 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 magma accumulation area way to the side of the digging. Uh, but uh, we basically, in this panel A, you see uh, the red uh, crater we call Sundhnjukar crater row, and then there is one further east uh, we call Eldvörth. There's another crater over there. Basically, there is a geothermal area the the whole way between this. So if one looks at the resistivity surveys that have been used to, to map out the, the geothermal area, they they come up with a a, a sort of a, 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 a area like stand that is very comparable to this magma domain. And then what is special is this graph here that we know that uh, there was really nothing happening uh, in terms of ground deformation other than subsidence for decades. Uh, then we have these inflation episodes, and, and yes, there are a li little different interpretation of this, is uh, what is the role of gas, uh, for example. But if we, if we would take all this, what we expect to have occurred in these inflation episodes, uh, it is still much less volume, even if it would all be due to liquid magma, than what comes out. So there was more magma. The magma was residing there. Uh, and it, uh, geochemistry will need to reveal, uh, I think, detailed comparison of these data sets. Uh, but I think the, the evidence is favoring that maybe it just was there. We didn't know very well about it. It may have had some uh, inflow, uh, even it could be invisible in, in geodesy if there is something that comes up and all the things that go down. More persistent magma accumulation area than we thought before, because before 10th of November, we were just wondering if these were individual cell intrusions, if we were in, interpreting them with, with geodesy. But we saw on 10th of November, there was much more uh, magma that came out about five times more than had accumulated in a few years. So my, I think the arguments would be fa uh, sort of for just long-term magma storage and, uh, and under the plate boundary, maybe it is normal to have some areas where there is more magma and others less, but maybe it is more extensive in the whole area than, than, than we think for the Reykjanes Peninsula, as you know, there's a lot of, uh, ideas about connections between the system. So it can be more through partial math. Maybe you can tell me what your thoughts are. 
But uh, I, I, I think uh, it's a very exciting question you were asking. Thank you so much. Hmm. We, we can discuss it with you too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thanks. Uh, there is another question from Karim. And yes. he's willing to also. Yeah. Uh, he's asking what the amount of relocated uh, seismicity you showed compared to all they recorded and non -review, reviewed ones. So the amount of relocated seismicity. Yeah, the, yeah. the seismicity we are using here is just really the uh, very minor part. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it is from the <clears throat> Icelandic Map Office uh, and what they have <clears throat> what they have recorded and uh, reviewed, sorry, what they have reviewed is maybe about 10% of all the earthquakes. We have also in supplementary material uh, from the, in the paper, we have some relocated earthquakes that we use to, to mark uh, or outline the dike plane. Uh, here in Iceland, we are lucky enough that there are many groups studying the seismicity and there will be many, many more uh, studies of the seismicity detail. There are more stations, more networks. But basically, what we see here, the aim of the uh, Icelandic Math Office is to, when there is a, a huge crisis like this, they cannot review all the events. They review maybe 10%, 20%, take all the big ones, uh, and then during a particular time, but I, I think the, the seismicity figures we see here, they give the, the overall feeling. I, I think the, the, the main message will not change. Uh, in the weeks before, we had a very large area of seismicity above this magma domain. Uh, then in the few hours before, there was a localized failure developing. Uh, and there was an earlier question about the zone of weakness. There are lots of faults in this area, so faults can be a zone of weakness. And, and then it is the, the uh, propagation uh, shown in the lower panel uh, from this weakness point, both to the north and to the south. These are key features. We can infer them from only a small part of the seismicity, but the Details will be super interesting as well, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? I I would like to ask one. Okay, uh, please. Uh, thank you very much for uh, first thing for the presentation. Uh, the GPS, uh, the the figure you showed uh, a few minutes ago on, on GPS deformations, exactly yeah. this one. Yeah. Um, I was wondering uh, about the, uh, the the source of these deflations that you have in between phases of inflation. Yeah. Have you do, you do you have a model for that? <clears throat> the the uh, some of it uh, may be due to geothermal processes, uh, both natural or man-made, because we have geothermal production in the area, but we know even. Uh, like in north of Iceland, Aska volcano, uh, there can be deflation that re relates to magmatic or geothermal processes. We have not noted in particular this one one uh, here recently, uh, so it's a it's something to look into. And there, of course, as you know, there has been. Uh, the aim and the idea to use gravity also to to study these so there there can be something more to be done to study this we we know in general uh if we look at sort of a regional scale in iceland that this part of the plate boundary in southwest iceland uh has been subsiding by a few millimeters per year so one needs to consider also that part of this is one can say regional subsidence along the plate boundary. Uh, we are we are having yes, uh, it's a it's a challenging to figure out exactly the the deformation source, but for the regional subsidence of the Reykjanes, uh, it can simply be due to 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 uh, plate stretching uh, and not sufficiently. Uh, enough material flowing upwards 
or it can also relate to glacial isostatic adjustment we have in Iceland. Uh, because the glaciers are retreating, we have a lot of moments because of that, and we are in a peripheral zone or quite far from the glaciers where magma can be actually moving towards the glaciers. So it's a combination. One needs to look at the regional. There is a localized subsidence signal. We saw it in the initial study of ground deformation in the area. Uh, because, yeah. could, be, could be the geothermal. It could be the cooling of the magma domain or the I mean, if you have magma that comes in uh, and the steadily cooling, it could be that effect. It could be geothermal that is overall cooling. But the numbers are a little larger, I think. Yeah, I see. Because the rates are also different. They seem to be different uh, in different periods, the subsidence they, rates. They are, yeah, they are slightly different, yes. And they would need to be compared to the production. Maybe, I, I think there is an influence from the production. The geothermal production. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Then, Thank then uh, uh, another question regarding the the conduit that you had between the the uh, magma domain and the dike. Yes. So, what? Why do you need such a conduit in the in the model? Why, why can it not be a, a part of the dike directly connected to to the magma domain? Uh, the uh, the we think it is. We are just wondering when we think about the, the magma flow, because we we are sort of wondering what is limiting the 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 flow rate. Uh, because if if the it can be that the dike connects uh, directly, okay, then it is just the segment of the dike that crosses the magma domain. Because right. we know that the magma is because we see a localized subsidence volume. So we think that it is it is localized. It is not tapping magma under all of the dike. Uh, so it could also be interpreted as just the where we have the effective uh, crossing of the magma domain on the dike. Okay. Okay. Uh, but but that is basically what we think is sort of the feeding area into the main dike. But it's a it's a good point. Maybe we 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 should have, have looked into that, that we don't need it at all. It is just that the dike, it, 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 it can be the fracture on the magma domain, basically. I see. Yeah. I see. Thank you. But maybe, maybe, there, maybe, maybe you are not correct. Maybe you have the right answer. <laughs> so feel free to, to look at this data and, and think of, of what your thoughts are about it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, uh, yeah. I have a little question on a little detail, which is yeah. when you show the, it's really a detail, when you show the, the history of the volume in into the dike, so this is connected to Mehdi's question, actually. There is this very little beginning when the rate is small and then the rate picks up very rapidly. Yes. So this is a real thing, right? Yeah, this is a this is a real thing. We we can see it really in the basically in the like in this curve, just the raw GNSS data. That uh, the I I think it's about the opening of the fracture. Uh, you you're just when you're forming you start from zero, yeah yeah to reach a rate, and it is I I I think about it in terms of the opening of this conduit and and we see <clears throat> the the maximum it, it rises rapidly and this is what we have seen also in the later events that uh, there is a rise time maybe a few hours for an eruption to pick up for example when the crack is opening and then they have been declining very rapidly, many of them, in a similar manner as this flow. Uh, yeah. Some of the later eruptions have sta stabilized to, to a low level eruption, but th there is, yeah, we, I would think of it, we have a, as such, we have a, a relatively large opening or fracture or conduit or whatever you call it on the, the magma domain. 
so so we can get a lot of flow through it, but it means also that it drops very fast uh, when the pressure drops be behind. But, the, but there seems to be a rise time. There needs to be a rise because it starts at zero. Uh, how gradual is that? Uh, maybe, maybe there is opportunity to study this more in detail, Eleonora, with, with looking more closely as it uh, was it uh, basically the question is how quick it is to reach the maximum flow rate. I think that can maybe be open. Is it minutes or uh, tons of minutes or is it one or two hours? Maybe even some more detailed models need to need to look into that. But the 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 this curve is really based on interpretation of hourly data. So the hourly GNSS. Yeah, so this is very interesting. I, I, so I see a connection. It's for now speculation, nothing more than that. But with the, uh, so eruptive models from dikes, you have rate, uh, first first law, then it increases and then it slows down again. And and yes. uh, people tend to attribute this to erosion of the fissure of the dike by the okay. flow, which basically makes the, uh, what was first very thin, it makes it like a, a bit thicker conduit. Yeah. Yes. And, and then your model with the conduit, you know, would become simply a way to parameterize this or to describe this, so. Yeah. It's very interesting topic, the, the eruption rates. Um... There's a lot on the recent eruptions. I, I think the the uh, what we have learned from the recent eruptions is that the rate is increasing when the when the eruptive issues are lengthening. So there's a very significant component of lengthening of the factors. Okay, so it might be similar. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Very Thank good. You. Any more co comments, question, clarification? Okay, I think there is no more questions and we can end here. So I would like to thank our speaker today, Dr. Feinstein Sigmundsen, uh, for this very nice uh, talk. And uh, also thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Thank you for your good questions and joining the talk. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.